We've got a big matchup on, on Saturday. I think this is the Big East game that everyone's had circled on the calendar. So, of course, we've got to bring our friend uh, Andre Greska of Paint Touches back on the podcast. He's been joining us year in, year out for these games to uh, help us preview Marquette. So welcome back, and uh, I hope you're excited for this one as much as I am. Oh, Jared, thanks for having me back. I'm I'm so excited. I like I guess I want to temper the excitement a little bit just because I know there's 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 games coming up beforehand, but there's uh it, it is the potential to be like the game of the reform big east, like yeah. it, if it all goes to plan. So I'm very excited. Yeah, for, for those of you tuning in, uh we are recording this before Marquette plays <laughs> Butler. So um we might have to uh, do some creative editing afterwards. Uh, no. uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, please, I, please come in my DMs and, and smear this all over my face when, <laughs> when they lay an egg. <laughs> so, so take me through this Marquette team this year. I mean, obviously got off to a, to a great start. Had a had a really successful outing in, in Maui, with the exception of that that loss in the finals to Purdue, but a, a close game there. Um, then kind of struggled a little bit at the start of Big East play, but of late they've seemed to turn back into the team everyone was expecting out of them in the preseason. So take us through what this season's been like to this point. Yeah, it's been strange because coming in with so much experience, I think it was 85% of minutes from last year were returning with Omax being the only person not back that had any sort of uh, rotation time. So you you knew what was coming in. You as a Marquette fan, you as a, as a general Big East fan, like this is going to be a team that, brought back almost every piece. Um, so you knew it was going to be good. And they, the way they started, like they kind of were a little bit better than I thought because I'd done some research over the summer. Um, and sure enough, teams that brought back 80% plus of eighty percent plus minutes um, that were top 10 teams or top whatever, 15 teams a year before, usually maintain that level. Mm -hmm. um, it was very uncommon for them to take a step up in terms of like from being like a top 10 to a top five. Uh, but they always, the, all four teams that I had found had finished in the top 10, um, had some decent um, NCAA tournament success. Because again, you knew what you were getting. Um, so as, again, through Maui, I, they were playing better than my, my like personally held expectations, but I know they were about where most Marquette fans thought. Like, this is an elite team. This is a top three team. This is a team that should be contending for, like, the number one overall seed. Um, so that that's where they were, even post, like, Purdue loss. Like, that was a very good loss in the sense that mm -hmm. Oso missed a most good chunk of the first half, and as soon as he came back, like, it just they dominated Purdue. Um, so you, you could always say, if he had not picked up that second foul, you know, maybe. It, so, again, really, really positive results. And then they lost to Wisconsin at Wisconsin, which – it was a strange game, but um, you know it happens. Um, you rivalry game at uh, Wisconsin. Shaka's a demon so far has not been able to beat um, the in-state rival. Um, but for me, it didn't really change much because I was like, you know, this is pretty much where I thought they would be. Um, at Providence, that loss was bad in terms of uh, that. Th that was one of the worst offensive performances that we've seen under Shaka from Marquette. But I was high on Providence at the time because I, I had been digging into their metrics. Um, and then you get to the Seton Hall loss and the Butler loss. So now you're talking about like four losses in like a seven or eight game span. Yeah. Um, and it's not something you could just wash away as like it's a bad game or it's this or that. Um, so at that point, the Butler, the, the first Butler game, it was at home. Uh, Marquette was up uh, double digits in the first half and it was one of 11 from three, like just wide open, no one in the gym kind of threes. And I tweeted at half. I'm like, this is like, the the worst outcome for a good first half you could ever have just because it, it should have been a 25 point route mm -hmm. could have put in the, 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 the scrubs for the last 10 minutes um obviously that didn't happen Butler picked up a little momentum and then Marquette forgot how to play like it was to the point where the, it was just so disconnected not like missing shots as much as like not following anyone on defense, missing at the rim, just as bad of a game um, in totality. And I, I think it's the most negative I've been in the Shaka era because I, I, we saw them lose to North Carolina by a million in the tournament. Yeah. Um, obviously, that was tough last year against Michigan State. There was, there was a bad UCLA loss in 2022 or early 2021, um, the 2022 season. But that Butler game saw a side, I saw a side of Marquette that I hadn't seen. So, I readjusted my expectations from like top 10 ish to like, well, let's, let's get in the tournament. Maybe you get a protected seed. So my, my belief system was like be a, be the feared four seed yeah. um, for the rest of the season. But 
something clicked. Um, there, obviously, there were some injuries at the time where Chase Ross, um, who many might not be aware of, he doesn't really score a ton. Um, he had a, a dislocated shoulder against Seton Hall, so he missed a couple of games. Um, he was able to come back um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, Sean Jones got injured towards ACL against Butler. So again, there was explanations for the dip, but it was just as bad as I'd seen him play. So to see this come up, this past seven games, uh, that's the Marquette team that that is like, okay, I know who that team is. Like that's the team I saw all of last year. That's the team I saw for the first three months, first two months of the season. Um, it's really a tale of two teams at this point. Yeah. As you look at, you know, this team, what when they've struggled and, and then when they when they've been successful the past, you know, I don't know, month it's probably been here. Um, what's been the biggest weakness for this team that like kind of did them in in these losses and then what do you think is kind yeah. of flipped uh over the <laughs> so i i don't you, if you're on twitter you might have seen it at some point because i know um some uconn fans picked up on it um i track uncontested threes like that is my I, I, i'm on synergy all the time but uncontested three it is the most valuable shot in the game even yeah. more so than a layup or a dunk because um it's a proof of the process like you don't get a ton of uncontested contested spot ups unless you have a very good offense UConn has the most uncontested threes in the league, obviously. And at the time, they were below average on the make. So my my takeaway at the time was like, watch out because this team is getting great mm-hmm. shots and not even hitting at an average rate. If they hit at an average rate, this is going to be um, a team you can't touch, which, yes. Um, but Marquette was even worse. So they were creating the third most shots, I think, behind just Creighton and UConn, about 12 uncontested shots a game. And they were shooting like 28%. From three and these uh, again, not on threes in general, just on uncontested yeah, spot ups, yeah. which they shot at 38% last year. And it, not that Omex was a great shooter, so you had the same people coming, the same types of shots, and it wasn't hitting. So, on the one hand, you had like analytical fans like me and, and some other people in scrambled days in the, in the Twitter community. Uh, Phil Bush is like, This is luck, like, this is bad yeah. luck, like, they, they are taking good shots from the right people, and it's not clicking. It's not hitting, yeah. Um, but then you also had it's been a month. You don't have a month of bad luck. Like at some point, this is just a bad shooting team, whether they regressed or they forgot how to shoot or their injuries took something away. Um, So that has completely flipped. And now I'm looking for some negative regression because they've shot over 45% from three, the last four games. I think they shot 50 against St. John's this past weekend. Um, Now they can't miss. Um, So they're finally back at average, but we haven't had like an average trend. We've had like super below and super above. Um, But if, if I was to say from an offensive perspective, the three ball is just such an important weapon because that's what the, t- the teams are forcing Marquette to do. They're packing the paint. They're like, we're not going to let the pick and roll get inside with o- Oso and Kolek. We're going to give you shots from the corner from Stevie Mitchell. We're going to, we, we're not really going to let Cam or Job shoot, but we're not, we're, we're going to press up on them. Um, but we really don't want, we want to collapse the paint. We don't want the penetration because that's where Marquette has lived the past two years. Top 10, uh, per, top 10 team in two point percentage the past two years. So that's the thought process. You live and die with giving them threes. Obviously Marquette has lived very well um, every, uh, of late of with those threes, but that's, that's the one area where on any given night, they, they miss a couple. It kind of like snowballs in, in their head. I think they were one for 11 against, I think I said that against Butler, mm-hmm. um, that one game. Um, so that's, that's one area. On defense, this team traps a lot. So you're going to see Klingon um, get doubled, maybe triple teamed at times. Uh, if you watched any of the Marquette-Purdue game, you're going to see a, 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 ver- a variation of that. So mm-hmm. that requires a lot of movement on the perimeter because now you have three guys to defend four players rather mm-hmm. than, than the normal one-on-one. Um, a team like UConn where you have multiple shooters, multiple ball handers, multiple creators, that, that could be a recipe for death. So if you don't get that steal, um, you're you're, you're going to get lucky at times because Caravan's going to hit that corner three. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Newton's going to drive because he's got the, the floor that's unbalanced. Um, so in terms of what I would say is is a potential for um, teams to exploit is that very, very um, aggressive trapping defense um, that when you have a good post player. I'm going to take a quick break from the interview to tell you about my friends at Martin Rosol's Meats. This fourth generation Connecticut family business produces kielbasa, hot dogs, sausages, and deli meats using Martin Rosol's very own original recipes. Their products can be found in grocery stores, delis, restaurants, and hot dog stands throughout the state. And if you're looking for your fill right away, check out their retail store in New Britain. 
For more information, visit martinrosalsinc.com and go support a UConn fan-owned business. And now, back to the interview. So we obviously got to talk about the the guy who who leads your team in, in Tyler Kolek. Um, how have you seen him in, improve from, from the great season he had last year? Uh, and how, how do you feel about him heading into this matchup against this UConn team? I think you can explain Marquette's season through Tyler's season. Start of the year, he was above and beyond where he left off as um, Big East player of the year against Illinois. He just took over that game on the road, uh, basically won it single-handedly, just, just took, picked apart that defense, um, took it to the rim at will. Um, but something happened. So he hit his first three against Seton Hall and then proceeded to go, I think he went one for 11 that game or some, something like that, where it was crazy. Like he didn't, he, he didn't shoot. And then he, he hit like the yips. Like I swear he wasn't hitting rim on like half of his threes. So when you, when he, when you, when he doesn't have that confidence, mm-hmm. teams are going to go under on every screen. So the pick and roll kind of loses its effectiveness. He can't really penetrate. because He's not the fastest guy in the world. Yeah. Like he's, he's shifty. He uses his weight well, uh, and he's very strong, but he's not someone that's going to blow past the defender, uh, particularly one with length. So what ended up happening is he had this stretch of games where I think I, I track player impact, which is Hoop Explorer, awesome site. If you ever yeah. um, wanted to get into deeper metrics, it's a hoop-explorer.com. It's free, gives you on off. Plus, uh, but they also do this game report where it gives you the player impact, which is a sort of like regression model RAPM. Basically, it gives you a nice, easy number to understand. Positive is good. Negative is yeah. bad. And he had back-to-back negative games against Seton Hall and Butler. Um, so at that point, you're like, what? what? And so that's where the narrative kind of yeah. cemented itself for a few weeks. Like, oh, he's not the same player. Even though his stats season long were as good as before, he had not lived up to that. The past seven weeks, he's been like not just best player in the conference. He's been best player in the country. Good. Um, Synergy, again, has a stat where it's points created, not just the points you score, but it gives you the points when you assist and Mm -hmm. um, when someone gets fouled off of your pass. So it gives you a little bit more of an idea of who's creating for the offense Um, against St. John's. He had 66 of the 80 something points were coming from Cole scores are bad. Like It's just absurd levels. Um, He's hitting the three at a 40 percent clip, which. I mean, we're two thirds of the way through the season. I would say maybe that's not sustainable, but he's just hot and cold. And right now he's on one of those hot spells that is difficult to to kind of contain because again, you can't go under. Uh, Villanova went under, got burned for three straight threes, flipped that game around. St. John's went under. They went from a twelve point lead to a five a two point deficit in about three and a half game minutes. Again, mm-hmm. off of Kolek threes. Um, and then once you decide to play him up, he's going to pick you apart. Uh, I think he had 13 assists against St. John's, um, leading the the league in assists. So he's been like better than than he ever was, with that potential for the blip. <laughs> and it's like you, you don't want to say he's 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 that player because he's proven for the large part of the last two years that he's one of the best players in the country. But um, you, you know that there's a potential that if he misses a couple shots, he gets less aggressive, um, then he's not necessarily um, elite level. He's just a very good point guard at that point. So when you when you look at this matchup with UConn, give me the X factor, you know, outside of Kolek or Oso, as a guy that you're kind of keen in on, as a guy who could be that difference maker in the game. Yeah, so I remember um, the tournament, in the Big East tournament last year, David Joplin kind of turned the game around. It's not that he had a great game. I think his stats weren't that impressive, Mm -hmm. but he had a few possessions off of that pick and roll where um, Marquette doesn't do a lot of pick and pop because Oso doesn't shoot. He doesn't shoot beyond the the free throw line. Um, And even when he does, it's a push. So when there's a pick and roll, it's usually meant to create some sort of penetrating action or some sort of dive in for Oso on the short roll. When Jop got involved, he was having to be guarded. I think he he was at the five for for a little bit because Oso might have been foul trouble or whatever. And so Sonogo was on him, and he he torched Sonogo. I think I, I did the stats last year, but like um, the on off when Jop and Sonogo was was covered by Sonogo was like plus nine or something like that. So it okay. really turned the game around. Obviously, Sonogo's not there. Um, Klingon plays a little bit more of a drop D, but. Klingon still is not going to give you 35 minutes. So you, there's going to be that between 20, 10 to 20 minutes where you have not the best player, not the best defender in the world on you. So I think that's going to be the key. Uh, we'll see a little bit of Ben Gold. Uh, he's a six foot 11 Australian. Again, 
good shooter in, in the sense that his average is fine, but streaky as heck. He went um, a month and a half without making a three, and now all of a sudden he's back up to like 38%. Um, so if you see him at the five, um, guarded by someone like Samson Johnson, um, I think that's going to be the potential to, to eat away at a few of the min- at a few of the, the scoring streaks because I have, I have a hard time seeing Marquette being able to um, – attack the rim as it normally does. It's going to have to resort for a little bit more creativeness um, with, with clicking down low. All right. I mean, I I think it's going to make for a a really fun matchup. I mean, you, you look at just where these two teams come in ranked nationally. Um, I think it's a really exciting matchup for the big East and for these two teams in particular. And it's crazy. We're going to get another one in what, two weeks, three weeks after this. (laughs) I know it was backloaded. I was just like, I was thinking about that the other day. I'm like, well, I'm I'm glad that UConn wasn't on the schedule when, when Marquette wasn't playing well, but at the same time, like it's, this is basically make or break. Not that the, I think uh, Bart Torvik has, you kind of 93% to win the regular season outright because you'd basically have to lose both games to Marquette plus have Marquette run the table for, and you still get a share if that were to happen. So um, for a regular season, um, not that I've resigned to second place, but I, I think realistically speaking, um, we know that UConn's probably going to take that. Um, and if they win on Saturday, that's going to be a coronation. But again, for Marquette, and I don't know, I'm speaking to someone who's won a couple titles, so I, I, I don't know that feeling. It's it's about March. Like, yeah. the Big East is fine. It's fun. I love it. I watch it every day. I live and die by it. But it's about getting a seed, getting a, a good draw, and making it to that second, a possibly third weekend. Because if you won the Big East and lost in the second round, like I could tell you, it sucks. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's no... You remember it finally, but you always had that like, little aftertaste in your mouth. You're like, yeah. oh, yeah, well... There's always next year. Well, this is the year. Marquette might lose a lot of pieces. Um, doesn't has a good recruiting class, but not necessarily something that's going to replace an Oso or a Colec type. Um, so for Marquette, this year is going to be like if this March doesn't happen, I'm just going to resign myself that we're <laughs> we're not we're not going to be be a March team ever. Oh, well, I, I I've got to wrap with this because I know you're you're my stats guy. Have you, have you have you been keeping track of Shaka minutes on the court this year? <laughs> Oh, I love it. He is so intense. Like, I know that the, there was a clip that I think it was going to Creighton that went viral and started yeah. this whole thing. But, like, that's just who he is. Like, we have a photographer that goes to the home games. And half the time, like, Shaka's on the floor, like, patting the, the ground, like, telling him to get low or doing stuff. So, um, that intensity just rubs off. And his players respond so well to it that um, it's such a connected team. Um, I love it. Like, I, I, I'm like, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I, think, I think both t- both fan bases, like, UConn fans love Hurley's firing, firing yeah, the exactly. five lines. You guys love Shaka doing whatever he's doing out there. So it's uh, something exactly. that the other fan bases could hate, but you at least could love it. <laughs> right. You, you you love to hate on them. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, well, I really appreciate you coming on, giving us a bit of a preview here. I think this is going to be a really fun, fun game, fun matchup then that we'll get again in a couple weeks and maybe even a third time at, at MSG. So uh, I, I can't bring, wait. Bring, bring these on. I think these, these are what, what if you're I know. a football fan. That's what we live for, right? Two teams, these are what you want to see. Yeah, I mean, top five matchup. I think it's only the third one in the, yeah. in, in the while for, for UConn. And I don't think Marquette's ever played a top five game um, in in Big East play. So it, yeah, yeah, exactly. this, is, this with, doesn't come around every often. With, with no offense to Georgetown and DePaul, after having to play them back to back, this is like, uh, we're, we're, we're back to uh, All right, back the to cupcake, cupcake season's over, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thanks so much and uh, enjoy these games. All right, thanks, Jerry. Appreciate you.